Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Genealogy Gems Podcast. In fact, so special, it doesn't even have a number. I'm doing this episode because There's something important going on in the genealogy community, and I want you to know about it right away. And I've got lots of great information for you to kind of help you navigate this new challenge and kind of falls outside of our normal podcasting schedule. So no problem. We're here to cover all of the important uh, genealogy events that are happening. And this is one of them. It's the end of the Family Search Microfilm Lending Program. Now, change is something that we can always count on, but it doesn't make it any easier, does it? Understanding why the change is happening, how it affects you personally, and what you can do to adapt does. So when FamilySearch announced the end of their longstanding microfilm lending program, I immediately sought out the key expert who can answer these questions for you. You know, it seems like only yesterday that I was interviewing Don R. Anderson. He was the director of the Family History Library, and we were talking about the future of the library and of Family Search. Well, back then, in 2009, he made the startling statement that their goal was to digitize all of the microfilms in Family Search's granite vault. And you can hear that entire interview in the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. That was episode number 16. Well, fast forward to today, and we see that in less than 10 years, that end goal is within sight. But that means we're also seeing the ending of a service that nearly every genealogist has tapped into, at least at some point, and that is the microfilm lending program. Family historians have been able to place orders for microfilms to be shipped to their local family history center, where they could then scroll through the images in search of ancestors. Well, on August 31st, 2017, the service comes to an end. Now, it can be kind of scary to see this come to an end before every single last roll of microfilm has been digitized and made available online. I mean, just head to social media to read some of the concerns that are kind of flying around out there. It's definitely been comforting in the past to know that the records that you need are just in order form and two weeks away. Well, I've always found and believed that being armed with information helps alleviate fear. And so upon hearing the news, I immediately reached out to FamilySearch to arrange a special interview with Diane Lussel. She's the director of patron services at FamilySearch. She runs the whole shebang. And in this special Genealogy Gems podcast interview, we're going to take the time to really comb through what the end of the microfilm lending program really means for you and what your options are for records access going forward. I've been so anxious to get this information into your ears. That's why we're doing it as a very special podcast episode, unnumbered, but getting to you um, about a week or so before the end. And certainly if you're hearing this into the future, when you go to Family Search and you realize, oh, I can't order that film anymore, you will now know the reasons why, and you'll be armed with the information and the strategies that you need to kind of work around that. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Diane Lussel, Director of Patron Services at FamilySearch. So one of the constant challenges for genealogists is gaining access to genealogical records that they need for their particular family history research. I imagine you've had that uh, challenge yourself. And Thankfully, since 1938, the Family Search Organization has been microfilming records around the world, and they've been making them available through the Family History Library in Salt Lake City and through a tremendous lending program with their family history centers, which are around the world. And that may be how you've gotten your hands on a couple of uh, records and microfilms over the years. But of course, now as the internet's been more accessible over the past two decades, this is changing the landscape of record access. So more and more, we are gaining access to digitized records online. And this has led to a really big change in the long standing microfilm lending program. 
I have invited Diane Lussel, the Director of Patron Services Division at Family Search, to join us here today on the podcast so we can talk about the change that's occurred, what it means for you, and what your record access options are going to be like going forward into the future. Hi, Diane. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm so happy I could come, and and thank you for inviting me. I imagine you've been very busy with the changes. I know that the last day for microfilm ordering was August 31st, 2017. And, um, you know, Family Search has been digitizing records for years, and so we know that uh, we're, we're going to be shifting from microfilm to digitization. Why is right now the time that the change is happening where you're actually discontinuing the physical microfilm lending? Well, we uh, this is such an exciting time, Lisa. I, I we've been looking forward to this day for many, many years because when you think about the fact that you can get access to these images immediately in your home, um, for the most part, there's some that you have to access through a center or a library, but the majority are in your home. That's that's pretty wonderful. Yes. Um, and so you know we're we're moving to a place where all of our fulfillment for your needs for records is going to be digital, and that's what this change is all about. So the reason that it's happening now is. Um, that a couple of different reasons. First, we have moved through the uh, a lot of the microfilm and have had those digitized and are up online. Um, so it was a good point with that. We've also seen a, a huge uh, drop in the orders of microfilm. So there's not very many being ordered now. So that kind of lined up. And then also our supplier, we have a single supplier for vesicular microfilm. And I think that's important to understand that we're talking about a certain type of microfilm. Um, because we use that type to make the copies and, and send it out to you. Um, we have a single supplier, and that supplier has been kind of raising prices and giving us the indication that they they would rather not be in that business. And so um, we, with all those things together and the fact that we would like to take the resources that we're currently using to duplicate films and send them out and ship them and all of that, we'd like to take those resources and and move them towards bringing you more records digitally, um, it would seem like the right time to make this decision um, to, to finally finish it. Now, uh, we do have some of the collection that has not yet been completed, of course. And so I think that's what's causing most people concern is what happens? Can I get access to that uh, during this time that you're still finishing it off? Exactly. And, you know, I have visited the distribution center for your lending program, and, and it was massive and it looked really complicated and and then when you add on the idea that the access to the actual film itself is changing i i just got a camera from my uncle and it's got a 25 year old film in it it took me all day to find a local store that could develop it for me so it's like a perfect storm of just a lot of technological changes which is exciting because as you said we can access things from home but I know that when it comes to the microphone that you guys have, the goal has been to digitize all of it. But explain to folks what the limitations are in terms of, do you have the rights to lend it? Do you have the rights to digitize and put up online everything that you had microfilmed? Right. So so we're always limited by the, the rights associated with the collections because the co- record custodians stipulate those when we do the agreements. And um, in microfilm, we've been circulating things. Um, our intention is to circulate digitally everything possible legally <laughs> for us to do. Right. Um, and that's the majority of the collection. Now, uh, in the process of doing this, what's happened over the years is laws have changed around data privacy um, particularly in Europe and in some other locations around the world. And, uh, and as we're going through and reviewing all of you, you can imagine these thousands of contracts for this process, um, we're discovering that there are some that because of the changes in the data privacy, they really should not have been continuing to circulate because of those changes. So those would then in the future be restricted um, because of the data privacy issues. And those are usually very modern records, you know, ones that uh, have living people in them. Um, So there will be a set of records that maybe you could have gotten on microfilm previously that you would not now be able to get digitally, but that's because they shouldn't have been anyway because of the data privacy uh, changes. So, um, but for the most part, what we're circulating uh, microfilm wise, you will, we will have access to digitally. Um, now about 20% of the collection, you have to access through 
the library or a family history center, any of our libraries or affiliate libraries, um, because of the contracts that we have. And that was true with the microfilm, of course. And so now it has to be true with the digital images as well, uh, based on the contracts. So there will be a certain set that is in that category. Let's dig into that a little bit. So we're talking about, you mentioned the term affiliate centers, and I know that there are some locations which aren't technically affiliates. Can you help define that for us? How do we figure out before we make the jaunt over to the local family history center, if that's one that actually can still have some of the microfilm? Help us sort that out. Okay. So if you go to uh, any center or affiliate library out there, and I'll tell you how to find those in just a minute. Um, the, they can keep whatever film they already ha- have on hand. Um, oh. There's nothing that's saying that they need to send it back. Now, that is dependent on decisions made at a local level. So, you know, the leadership of either the affiliate library, which is normally in a public library, um, or a family history center, which is often in a, uh, a LDS chapel, mm-hmm. uh, the, the local leadership there will make a decision about you know, the film and what happens to them in the future, but we're not asking them to send them back. So you'll still be able to access them there. And the library here in Salt Lake will maintain a a large microfilm collection uh, as well. So, um, so it'll still be available that way. Now um, the, the way that you find these locations is if you go into family search um, and up in the right hand corner, there's a get help link. And the get help link lets you uh, get in touch with us, and then you can you can search actually using your zip code um, to find which uh, centers and affiliate libraries are near you, and both will appear on the map that appears, um, so that you can find out which ones are near your location. The affiliates are, as I said, often public libraries, so they may have extended hours beyond what the family history center might have. Um, Because a family history center is often, uh, as I said, in a chapel and manned by volunteers. And so they may not have as many hours as your affiliate libraries may have. So whatever collection that they had on hand when the lending program came to an end, they had the option to decide if they were going to hang on to it, if they were going to send stuff back. There's going to be some just at the family history library in Salt Lake City. Do we go into the card catalog to to identify where the existing films are still located? Yes. So the best way to find out what's available, both digitally and um, and where the films might still be physically located, um, is through the Family Search catalog on Family Search. So if you go to Search on Family Search and then to Catalog, you can look up your location, look up the records you're interested in. And it will it will tell you where those can be found. Now, um, if it's di- available digitally, and actually the most of the people that I've talked to where they were, had this concern about, oh goodness, I'm not going to have access to my films. When I talked with them and we looked it up, their their records were already available digitally. They just didn't know it. Oh, um, <laughs> right. Yeah. So if you go into the catalog and you look it up uh, where it lists the microfilm, there will be a little camera icon out to the right-hand side. And if you see that little camera icon, you can click on that, and that takes you straight into the digital images for that uh, record. Now, the, we publish those. We do about, we digitize about 1,500 microfilms a day at the vault. Wow. And we publish those pretty immediately up onto the website through the catalog. You will not find those through the historical records part of the, the of family search under search records. Um, they're just through the catalog. So there is a much larger collection available through the catalog than what you see in the historical records section. When we get notifications, uh, I know I get your press releases and such on the new records that are coming out. Does that include those? Because we do publish every Friday kind of a, a rundown for all of our listeners out there, what the newest records are that are coming online. It does not currently. Uh, that publication only includes the things that are published online to, in the historical records section of oh, the website. Okay. However, with this change, we're looking to change that so it will include um, these that are being published in the catalog. Now, the challenge with that is the volume, because 1,500 films a day is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and these films, because of the way that we did this initially, we prioritized all of the films that were had been ordered in the last five years to make sure that those were available digitally. So it's been kind of piecemeal a little bit. So you might have two or three 
films in a full collection that have been digitized and the rest maybe not at this point. And so trying to help you understand what is and is not available through that publication, we're, we're still working through the details. But the intention is, as we go forward, we will prioritize filling in those collections where maybe one or two films have been digitized, but the rest have not yet. We'll go through and, and make sure the whole collection has been digitized. And then we're also going to introduce a process where you will be able to let us know if there is a film that you absolutely need, um, you can let us know and we will work that into our prioritization and try and get that to you as quickly as we can. Um, you know, if you think about how long it took to get a microfilm to del be delivered to you once you ordered it, you can think about this kind of the same time frames for, for when it might be then available to you digitally. How would they be contacting you to make that kind of request? So we're working on that process right now, trying to finalize it. Okay. Um, so, so there's kind of two options we're looking at at the moment. One, you would contact us through our support line, the help line, and let us know. The other is that we would have a form up that you would just fill out. Now, the form one's probably going to, that's what we're, we're hoping to get established, but that's going to take a little bit of more time to get established and up. Right. So we may go out the gate with a not as ideal of a process, but we want to make sure that you can let us know. So we'll be clear about what that is as we move to September 1st. When we get into the catalog, have you already flagged which ones are going to have restrictions? They're just not going to be able to be digitized? Um, because I think some people might be thinking, well, maybe I should just hold on and wait and over the next couple of months. Maybe they'll get to this one or I'll put in a request. But I imagine that's a big job that you'd have to go in and try to flag every single one that you know you're not going to have the rights to digitize. Tell us how you're going to deal with that. Well, um, yeah, that, that has not occurred and um, would be pretty impossible to do at this stage yeah. um, just because of the volume of what we're, we're dealing with trying to go through. And we're doing it as we go to, to digitize the, the films. And so we discover it as we go as opposed to knowing ahead of time. So if they put in a request, you pull it out, you go, okay, well, let's look at doing this. And then you realize, no, oh, this one's not going to be able to do it then at least they would get that information? Yes, yes, they right. would. Um, well, um, what would happen is we're working on a way that within the catalog you would you would be able to identify that. So, um, so for example, a request actually came from the community out there that we'd be able to distinguish um, if a record can be viewed in my home, you know, just at home, or if I have to be at a facility to view it or if there's some other restriction on it. And so because of that feedback, we thought, well, let's see if we can figure out a way to, to help people to understand that. Now, these things probably won't be ready right out the gate, um, but we're looking to ways to make it simpler for you to understand what the challenges are with the records that you're trying to access. Sure. So if we're looking online and we see a record and it's not been digitized yet, would we, at this point until you get more formalized processes going, would you still encourage people to get in touch with the Family History Library in Salt Lake City? What other options are they going to have to gain access? So first what I would do is I would look, um, because we, we'll maintain the film inventory so we know where the films are located. Um, so I would first look and see, is this film available somewhere near me? Um, or if I have an opportunity to come to the Family History Library and then the film is there, great. But so first look and see if you can locate it. Then you can let us know through the channels that we'll have available to you what the film is, and then we'll put it into the list to be prioritized to be digitized. But I would always encourage folks to look and see if they're located near where that film already is, because that will be much quicker for them to get access to that. If Salt Lake City is the only place, and of course, this really whittles down to the big fear of everybody is, oh, that one film I'm going to need, it's only going to be in Salt Lake City, and I can't get there. What other kinds of options might a person like that have? Well, so I think that there are some options available to them because we have a, a large group of professional researchers who come to the library every day. And those folks could probably be useful to you in looking up those records and getting copies of whatever is needed. So that's one option that people could uh, take to do that. Uh, the majority of what we'll have, I don't think the case would be that the only place you can get it is the Family History Library. Right. Um, if we do have a fair number of collections that are in that category as we finish this process off, then we'll look at ways to to provide some access where we can. Um, but that access would probably be in a digital way as well. Mm -hmm. So um, 
yeah. So uh, that would be my suggestion is that, that they reach out to those who are here every day and could take a look at that. And, and I think, you know, you have other uh, websites where you can get access to professionals as well, or just, you know, good Samaritans that want to help sure. you out. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's lots of those. Finally, are there any records that the people listening are going to completely lose access to? Um, the only ones that would be in that category is because of the data privacy. Um, okay. So if there was a, a an issue with, you know, a law change that made it so that we could no longer provide access to those. But that would have been true in the microfilm world as well. Exactly. So really, it really doesn't change in that respect. We're not losing records. We're changing up how we access them. And I, I think you've helped shed a lot of light on kind of what the process will be. And it sounds like you have a big job ahead of you. How quickly do you think it's going to help once the lending process is let go of uh, that the resources start going to all of this other work now that you have to do on the digital side? So um, I think it will move pretty quickly for us to you know, start to do more with the resources that we have. So for example, we're collecting around 3 million images with 300 camera crews out there wow. um, about a week. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's a lot, you know, and we want to shift a lot of resources. Another place that we'd like to capture more is with Africa and the oral genealogies project that we have yes. and, and gain more access there. So, so we'll be shifting to those. And then of course the, the vault is moving at a pretty good clip already with about 1500 a day. Wow. So I think we'll be able to keep up pretty well with the demand that's coming at us from people. But you know, we'll, we'll evaluate that as we go and determine if we need to, to boost up more there or not, um, to be able to move more quickly for folks. So any other questions that I didn't think about that you've been hearing online and social media, and that you'd love to give us some input on? Well, we have had some questions from affiliate libraries mm -hmm. about how do they get the access. Right. <laughs> um, so that's been happening online um, a little bit. And so uh, we just want them to know that we'll be reaching out to them via calling all of them, actually, and helping them through this process of, of setting up the things that they need to technically to be able to get access to the images digitally. So that's definitely something they should know. The other thing is that we have a lot of people who don't actually know how to use the catalog mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, they've grown up in a search world or in a, you know, looking at the historical records, the browsable images. And a lot of people don't understand that there's, a lot of different ways to access the records on family search. So you have search, which is a very small percentage of the collection actually compared to the whole. And then you have the historical records that are only browsable and that you can, you know, go in and, and look at the images browsable. And then you have everything that's been published through the catalog. Um, so there's kind of three places that they need to look. So I think that's the, the biggest piece I've seen is people just don't know. They're not aware of where to find those things. And, you know, eventually it'd be nice when those things maybe come together. But at this point in time, they're, they're separate. And that's because we wanted to ensure that you would maintain access. Um, if we can just publish them quickly and maintain access for you, that's the best uh, in our minds. So. Absolutely. Well, I know that um, Sonny Morton here at Genealogy Gems is going to be joining us in future episodes talking more about that, just those different areas. And I love the way that you've kind of laid it out for us, because I think a lot of people weren't that familiar with the differences. And she's going to be helping us get a little more savvy in that uh, ongoing research. Diane, thank you so much for taking time to visit with me to answer some of the questions. I know that you know that the emotions that run high are only because people are so passionate about family history, and they're so appreciative of what Family Search has done. It's been an amazing resource that you guys provide to the public for free, which is just absolutely invaluable. And um, I know that I have a lot of confidence in where you guys are going because you always are out there looking forward. How far out into the future you guys look and you plan for is just phenomenal. And it's not just about us accessing records. It's going to be for generations to come. And I, I love the fact that you guys are really laying the groundwork for that. Well, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, we are all about getting you access to records so you can find your ancestors. And we will always be about that. So I'm glad that... Uh that I could come and, and help 
people to understand what's happening and hopefully be a little less concerned about the change. I know it's difficult, but it's a wonderful change too. So thanks again, Diane. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for this very special episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Uh, My thanks to Diane Lucille for joining us here today. I hope you enjoyed it and that you feel that you're walking away empowered with information and strategies for getting your hands on the genealogical records that you need for your family history. That's the most important thing to us here at Genealogy Gems. And in addition to the latest breaking news and strategies as we're talking about here today, of course, we're devoted to bringing you the Genealogy Gems the items that we think are the best and that we've checked into and we really feel like are going to make a difference in helping you find your family history and climb your family tree. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And of course, the best way to uh, stay in touch with us and let us help you in your research is to sign up for the free Genealogy Gems email newsletter. It comes out once a week and it is jam-packed with what we really feel like is the breaking news and the best genealogy gems out there. Um, our favorite strategies, what's new in technology, and of course, this free podcast. And if you like this podcast and our newsletter, you're going to love being a premium member. That's going to get you access to hundreds of exclusive podcast episodes that are just for our members, plus our entire video class series um, with genealogy instruction and ideas and strategies. And I just want to put a little bug in your ear. Something big is coming, and we are going to make some uh, announcements in the near future. I hope it's the near future (laughs) on uh, what is coming to Genealogy Gems Premium. If you are not a premium member yet, you are going to want to get on board because we're going to have some incredible new additions to Genealogy Gems Premium. So stay tuned for that. And also, we're going to have a pretty cool announcement in our next regular Genealogy Gems podcast episode about the free Genealogy Gems podcast. So you got to tune in, stay in touch with us. And of course, the newsletter is the best way to do that. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.